Sounds good. Thank you for joining the College of Business Administration at LMU for our webinar series, Impact Insights. My name is Dale Smith. I'm the Dean of the College. And as we do with all of our Impact Insights guests, we do record these and we'll put the recordings up on the website to, uh, to promote. We're so pleased to have you join us as we discuss how businesses can change the landscape as a result of not only the co the COVID pandemic, but also the social movement that's taking place around Black Lives Matter at this particular time. We are dedicated to bringing you impactful insights, valuable insights, and doing our part to create a stronger Los Angeles and beyond, embracing a diversity of thought and experience. This series that we're bringing to you is aligned with our mission to advance knowledge and develop business leaders with creative confidence and moral courage to be a force for good in the Los Angeles and global community. As we do with all of our uh, webinars, a few community guidelines to get started. Patty? Can we advance to the community guidelines? Advance the slide. There we go. So we're asking you to set your Zoom to uh, speaker view if not already. That would allow you to actually speak after uh, the presentation to be able to engage in conversation. We are manning, manning both the question and answer in the chat. So uh, if you have questions as the presentation's going on, throw them up on the Q&A and I'll moderate those questions uh, after Bill begins his part. Um, and we'll leave time for it to be a very interactive question and answer. You can feel free to raise your hand and we will unmute you so that you can be heard. And just a friendly reminder once again that the webinar is being recorded and will be available after the presentation. So today we're excited to uh, cross disciplines today and have Dr. William Parham joining us from the School of Ed. He's a professor in the counseling program at LMU School of Education and is interim associate dean of faculty. In addition to his role as a scholar, a teacher, and a counselor, Dr. Parham is also focused on working with athletes across organizations such as the NBA, the NFL, the U.S. Tennis Association, Major League Soccer, and with college athletes. His emphasis and specialization on personal empowerment, discovering and cultivating innate talents, and looking for opportunities in every situation is more important today as we adapt our organizations in this uncertain future. He also has expertise in mental health, a, mental, a major challenge for many of us, and particularly in a time marked by the challenges of living and working amidst COVID and our current unrest. In light of COVID and the Black Lives Matter movement, Dr. Parham will be talking to us today about how the pandemic has provided us with opportunities to think differently about personal and business relationships and where each fits into short and longer term plans. Feel free to ask your questions in the chat and Q&A throughout the presentation. And with that, I turn it over to my friend and colleague, Dr. Bill Parham. Thank you, Dean Smith, and uh, welcome to everybody in the audience. It's a pleasure to be here and honor. Uh, I really want to maximize your time. I know that I appreciate your time and willingness to engage in the conversation. My goal today are really two or three. One is to have a conversation. Uh, I don't want to sort of lecture at you, is this the nature of what we're going to talk about? And uh, the world around us is an ongoing set of dialogue, some quite difficult, all challenging, and some that force you to draw a line in the sand somewhere about where you stand. Uh, I believe it's true what they say, that if you don't <clears throat> stand for something, you will fall for anything. And I think it's important to really get a clear sense of where you stand. The second goal I have is just to get you to go, hmm, or ah, just once or twice during the presentation. And uh, the comments I might say or any questions that might be posed by the audience. Uh, my goal is really just to get you to think differently and entertain some different concepts. You will hear me frequently use the expression, invite you to consider. That comes from the notion that all of you, <clears throat> excuse me, are already rooted in a philosophy, a way of life, a, a set of rules for yourself designed for living the world in which you inhabit. And I have zero investment in wanting to alter that. I am invested, however, in giving you something to think and to add to the perspective that you have and hold uh, something different uh, just to consider. I also want you to consider one of two or three mantras that I'll get to later on. The first one is which 
while we can't control the direction of the wind, we can adjust the sail. That is to invite you to consider that there's much that goes on in the world over which we have little to no control. But we do have 100% control over how we respond to the way that the world presents, to the challenges that the world presents. And, and the three main ways of responding are cognitively, how we think about what's going on. And that really frames the next two, how we behave in response to what we see and how do we feel in response to what we see. Uh, the last thing I'll say is that <clears throat> as uh, Dean Smith correctly said, this is about looking at opportunities. I add to that opportunities that are often hidden in plain sight. I think it is important to begin to reframe the experiences and really find the treasure in the trials that are, that are there. So with that, we can go to the first slide. Bill, you'll need to share your screen. There we go. Okay, there we go. So again, the price of the ticket using current events as templates uh, for understanding and appreciating business success. The price of the ticket, just for reference, is a title of a book of one of my favorite authors, um, James Baldwin. Um, and I, I just thought it was compelling for what we need to do now. And, and hopefully that'll become clear as we move through the presentation. Uh, but I just want you to really think about what price are you willing to pay to stand up uh, morally, ethically, responsibly in, in times that we have now. What I want to do is present three lenses through which to view and organize uh, the Q&A as we move forward and encourage all of you to really think about what we're really talking about. The first has to do with the context of uh, the two pandemics that currently occupy our, our space, uh, COVID-19 and racism are the two pan pandemics that I'm speaking about. But all of those are situated within a larger political environment. So when we look at COVID-19, <clears throat> it's clear and everybody will agree that it's unprecedented, that it's historic and it's global. I think everybody will also agree that it continues to trigger and ignite a range of what I call circumstance and situation-based emotions. In other words, everybody's experience of this exact same pandemic is quite different. And so while the pandemic may be the same, our emotional appreciation and experiences vary by the number of people um, really experiencing this particular um, global pandemic. Uh, it really does have a way, importantly, of unmasking old hurts, emotional wounds, and dare I say trauma. It is true that people are pushed to the limits of their emotional vulnerability. Studies have shown just since COVID has gone on in the last 14 weeks, increases, for example, in domestic violence, increases in hate crimes, specifically directed toward Asian communities, uh, increases in depression, uh, trauma, uh, anxiety. So this is very real. And again, when you add the fact that it has been prolonged, the psychology of confinement, the economic uh, realities that it really has imposed upon us. It really has stretched us in ways that we couldn't have predicted. Many of us are not prepared or we're not prepared to manage. And it really has been a swirl of chaos and confusion. And the fact that this thing keeps changing, um, it's a lot, so there's a resurgence now, for example, in I think 30 out of 52 states. Um, that's going to not necessarily set us back, but it's gonna prolong the fact that we are still in the first wave of this pandemic. So the emotional component is very, very key. An additional context within this pandemic, though, is the African-American and persons of color and elderly who are disproportionately represented in a positive COVID uh, within our already existing profiles of disparity. 
that's important because again, those existing profiles of disparity are actual lived experiences of communities of color and traditionally marginalized populations. And so then when you add something of this nature on top of that, that exponentially agitates the emotions. So the, one of the questions on the table at this point is what emotional reactions have surfaced within you at the beginning, middle, and now uh, the present of COVID-19? And if you're honest, I think you will see initially you were sort of caught off guard, but also, okay, say this will be short lived. And a lot of that was communicated to you. So it's understandable why we all believed that it was gonna be short lived. But as the days morphed into weeks, morphed into months, we begin to say, whoa, this is gonna be here to stay for a little while longer. And there are a range of emotions because it's not just you that you are concerned about it or the people in your circle of influence. So spouses, children, uh, extended family, uh, work colleagues. Uh, never have we uh, experienced not being able to hug, to touch, to have markers of social space that we took for granted when we are in our offices and hearing the sounds and having the smells and the visuals all around us. When those things are not there, that brings up a lot of emotions. The other thing that is important to keep in mind with this particular um, issue, one of the uh, statements and mantras that has been argued or promoted certainly by public health that I happen to agree with from a medical standpoint of view is safer at home. And again, from a pandemic a viral point of view, that makes absolute sense because we want to decrease the social, uh, the spread. But safer at home from a psychological point of view can be quite devastating. Uh, work and distractions of the day are often places that people see, where they seek solace and refuge from uh, a home environment that maybe is dysfunctional, maybe traumatic, is not positive at all, and or where they're left to sort of think more on their own about stuff that has gone on in the past. So Safer at Home really needs to be put into the context uh, of mental health and wellness and not solely medical. But essentially to end up on this particular uh, lens, I'm really promoting self-reflection that really represents a critical area of exploration. And it really represents a portal through which you can then appreciate the experiences of others, particularly those who are more marginalized. All right, racism and social protests. I've labeled this, and I think appropriately so, is the ever-present pandemic. It is a pandemic that has not gone away. Uh, and when you look at U.S. history, we have been witness to any number of social protests, just a, a thumbnail sketch or a listing of a few. The Civil Rights Movement is probably the more pronounced. Uh, and that was in the 60s, although there were many before this, but let me just start there. And within that, there was a Black Panther Party movement, Mexican-American Civil Rights, uh, the Japanese-American Redress, uh, gay liberation movement, women's liberation. But I think it's also important to understand that these civil rights social protest movements also reawoke the conservative movement here in America. They said, whoa, something else is going on that we are no longer in control of. But essentially, I think it was also important to call out systemic racism. It is a 400 year old pandemic. And in my view, it is the tie that binds all the above referenced movements. You see, systemic racism is rooted in notions of white supremacy and black inferiority. And the laws, policies, procedures, and guidelines are in place, really, to keep people in their place. And I think a good understanding of history and how these laws were constructed and how they are maintained lends credence to that particular observation. Even when you bring it closer to home and understand the history of California, relative to Native Americans and Japanese and Chinese and African Americans, the history here is not, uh, we are not without our sin. 
and the vestiges of those sins are still very present. I encourage you uh, to understand the history of the very city in which LMU resides, Westchester. I invite you to understand and really look up the history of Manhattan Beach, one of the more exclusive areas on the west side, but historically a uh, conclave of African-American wealth. So asking yourself, why is that no longer true? Uh, again, I encourage you to look at your history with that. I also want to bring to mind relative to a lot of the social protests. What I saw was not simply a killing of a black man by a rogue cop. I saw a lynching by knee of George Floyd and it was witnessed by a global audience, all eight minutes and 46 seconds. That image is, is seared in our minds and hearts and it's not easy to unsee it or unremember it. I believe that this is a salient feature in why there's been such a global response. You see in the past, and I've been around for the uh, watch riots, uh, for some of the civil unrest relative to Rodney King, and there've been several others. But when the news got out globally, it was, uh, we relied upon, or the world relied upon American transmission of the slant or the story, the version of the story that they wanted to communicate. What we got a chance to see in the lynching of George Floyd uh, was a global witness in the moment of what was really going on. And so the anger, uh, the audacity of somebody to take another human life in such an inhumane way and, and, and not having any angst about doing so was very troubling and nonetheless real. And I think that that, uh, uh, woke up the globe and global citizenry regarding the issues of racism and a system that is tainted and needing reflection. And even now you see uh, a part of this movement taking down of statues, symbolic of racism, the, the flag, for example, uh, down in the race car circuit. Um, Michael Eric Dyson is, uh, I think, prolifically uh, brought a distinction here that I think is important. It's important to translate and shift from statues to statutes. That is, at some point, we had to get in there and vote and change these laws and policies because it's really going on. That said, when you look at the systemic racism and the social protests, again, I want to get to the emotional level. What feelings emerged and continue to emerge in response to America's racist ideologies? I think that's important to get into. How do you respond emotionally to the image of George Floyd's lynching, if you even consider it a lynching? Again, that's something that I really want you to examine. The third lens that I want to add is that of the current political climate and we can say a lot about that, but I really want to break that down into three, co three components. One, when I look at the process of the election of Barack Obama, the 44th president of the United States, that was a clear deviation from everything America thought it was relative to the executive leadership. And in my mind, it awakened American conservatives and religious right communities, among others. They said, whoa. It is true when your alarm clock goes off, you have two options every morning. One is to hit the snooze alarm and go back to sleep. And the other is to wake up and get in the mix and get on with your day. I think when Barack was elected the first time, people were caught off guard, stunned, but got on board and in essence sort of hit the snooze alarm. But boy, when he got elected the second time, they cut that alarm clock off and got in the mix. And I think what resulted was a 216 political campaign where everything was really unearthed in a very ugly way, questioning Obama's birthright, 
Hispanics are rapists and murderers, the ban against Muslims, uh, the immigration and the wall, uh, the Billy Bush interview, which was offensive and obscene, notions of cricket Hillary, uh, those SOB athletes taking the knee, they ought to fire them all. Global warming, global warming is just weather. I mean, these sorts of slogans, beliefs, uh, campaigned um, marketing is, is just propaganda. Nonetheless, there was a, a number of people who believed it. So 217, we look at the border wall, again, more immigration, attempts to dismantle the Affordable Care Act, specifically now during the pandemic that we currently are in. Russian interference in U.S. elections. Uh, COVID will be passed, and the, the modeling of uh, going against science is just incredible. When you look at unemployment, the paycheck, paycheck uh, protection plan, th there's just a lot swirling around us that adds to the confusion, the disarray, the fact from fiction. There are reasons for all of this, I suspect, that we can maybe get into later. But I say all of this to say that there are a number of emotions coming up within you, I suspect, related to the current political climate. So how might your potential audience for business feel about the current political climate? So I'm inviting you to put these three things together, the COVID and the emotional surge that comes up within you, the uncertainty, the chaos, uh, the short and long-term implications of that, but also the pandemic of racism, ever-present, no evidence of it ceasing. And one could argue that America really has not failed at getting rid of racism. They actually have been quite successful at maintaining it. And then this last lens to which to view business and moving forward is the current political climate and all of its fact versus fiction invitations that keeps you dizzy, uh, busy in a dizzying sort of way. So I've always believed that a person will never see their reflection in running water. It is only when the water is still where their reflected image begins to emerge. So the question for you to consider is what are your beliefs about systemic racism and socially structured inequities? relative to business, education, healthcare, housing, employment, economic mobility, and many more. What reactions do you have to Amy Cooper, who as you recall is the white female who called law enforcement on an African American male for asking her to leech her dog in an area of a park where she was in clear violation of posted ordinances? Any thoughts about her choice to weaponize her privilege? Why was she even able to think that that would be possible? Because of the history here. Another question, what percent of your waking hours do you spend thinking about systemic inequities? In other words, how aware are you of your own implicit bias relative to race, class, culture, ethnicity, and other markers of identity. <laughs> the next question is, what if anything have you done to remain aware of the lived experiences of historically marginalized, commu marginalized communities? And how is your awareness reflected in the products you produce in a way and in the ways you pitch and market those products? You've heard me say the words lived experiences <laughs> because it's very deliberate and that it is true that all of us can be looking at the exact same thing and have a different experience, not only of what we are looking at, but what it triggers in our own history and the baggage that we carry. See, it is true that everybody has baggage. The only question on the proverbial table then are two. How many pieces of luggage do you have and what's packed inside each bag? And I bring that up because when there's this, such a swirl of emotions coming up in response to current stressors, 
it is likely to trigger and ignite uh, you in different ways that you spend all your life trying to forget, but nonetheless come flooding to the front. So last set of questions, and I'll share some references, and I want to throw it open to Q&A. Is to what degree are you a visible ally in your support of social justice and inequity, while at the same time denouncing systemic structured racism? See, it's not solely sufficient to say that you aren't a racist or you support social justice. But are you visible uh, physically, uh, audibly, in supporting that, but also in denouncing a system of inequities and socially structured racism? What is your track record relative to philanthropy and supporting programs that support equity? How often do you partner with other businesses who do not support social justice or inequity? When doing your homework on potential business partners, do you factor in their track record for denouncing inequity? The bigger questions here is, is there any element of collusion with systemic racism and Faustian bargaining in how you conduct your life and your business? As you recall, Faust made a deal with the devil for a few more days of good, uh, even though he was already doing well, but he didn't want to stop having all of that. And so certainly in one of the versions, the classic versions, sold his soul to the devil and he lost that bet. Last question and then before I turn it over to Q&A is, have you put in place long-term sustainable business plan for visibly advocating for equity and social justice? In other words, in short, are you willing to go the distance as a business person and visible ally and advocate for social justice, knowing the risks involved in making that decision? You see, it's tough when you really put yourself out there. It pushes you to decide morally and ethically, what am I willing to stand for? And I'll be the first to admit, those are not easy decisions to make. Many of us have not had to make those decisions for quite some time. In fact, we've had the luxury and privilege of not really having to really. And so I, I want to leave off this part of the presentation by suggesting that there's absolutely no way to get around that COVID-19 is very serious. It's deadly, if not attended to and addressed. And it's going to be here for quite some time. This is not a short term uh, situation. I was told when I was growing up, if you're going to be in something for the long haul, bring your lunch. Because this is an all day thing. And this is certainly a long term thing that we need to bring our lunch to. So are you willing to really go the distance for that in a sustained way? I think that's going to have to be an important question to ask because there are going to be some risks involved, as you see in the media. Uh, there's going to be a lot more chaos, a lot more venom. Uh, and particularly now, between now and election, it's going to really amp up. James Baldwin wrote another book, one of my also, uh, also a favorite of mine, which is The Fire Next Time, and I encourage you to read that. But again, where I'm ultimately going with this, hidden in all of this drama, are opportunities. And the opportunities are not necessarily obvious. They're often hidden. Two images I want to leave you with before we turn it over for question is that certainly these days and times over the last three or four months, it really is felt that there has been a dark cloud or a shadow that has been cast over us. I often also believe that in order for a shadow to appear, it has to mean that there's light nearby. You can't have a shadow without light. And I'm really believing that when you put your minds together, you get like-minded folks and you really have a plan, a North Star goal 
to turn a treasure into a trial that it can work. The other image I, I like and I'll share is that of an archer. And that when an archer strings his bow or her bow and pulls it back just a short bit and lets it go, it doesn't go anywhere. Yet if they reload their bow and draw the string as far back as it can and let it go, it'll fly far, high, and true, often hitting the target that they were aiming at. I see that as important because a lot of times what I'm hearing, particularly in, in the context of business, uh, in the context of keeping your family together, in the context of work productivity, is that it feels like what's going on is really set all of us back. And those are realities. And there's not a lot we can do in the short term to sort of turn that around quickly. But one tool that we have is how we think about that. And the concept I'd like for you to consider is that every setback in reality is a setup to fly far, high, and true, just like the archer. And so I want to acknowledge that these are tough times, feels like dark days, feels very, very overwhelming in ways that neither of us listening to this uh, podcast can fully appreciate the experience of anybody else. And we are all in the same boat. And so working together and moving forward, I'm believing, again, as I started off saying, while we can't control the direction of the wind, we certainly can adjust the sail. So with that, let me leave you with a couple of references. Uh, the Gibbons book, City of Segregation, it really talks specifically about Los Angeles in 100 years of struggle for housing. Second reference that I invite you to consider is that of our very own Marnie Campbell professor uh, here, associate professor here at Loyola Marymount University. In 2016, she authored a book, Making Black Los Angeles, Clash, Gender, and Community. And she goes way back, 1850 to 1917. Excellent book. And the last thing that I want to uh, re-invite or invite you anew is the Harvard Implicit Association Tests. And, the link is up here and I encourage you to uh, copy that and or take a look at that and really begin to explore your own biases. It's, it's a fascinating instrument. Um, and I encourage you to take a look at two or three um, biases that you may have. And I think they have like seven or eight, maybe 11 categories. And I encourage you to spend some time taking that particular test and really going, hmm, I never thought about it, or something that catches you by surprise. So with that, I'll uh, unshare the screen and entertain any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Partner. Um, while uh, the uh, chat and the questions are open, um, we have uh, our first question um, from Scott Delante, who asks, what is the price of the ticket for my continued use of Facebook to keep up with family and friends? Um, am I subsidizing Facebook advertising revenue while certain groups use Facebook to promote misinformation on COVID and racism? Um, you know, given that you wanna share that information and you wanna get out there and, and, and be the archer on social media, are you also at the same time supporting something that you might not want to be supporting? How do you reconcile those kinds of issues, Bill? I don't know that it's, it's, there's ever complete reconciliation uh, for that. So let me just say that up front. I think that that's precisely the dilemma though that we face. Because on the one hand, it, it is a tool for really sharing the good works, uh, uh, advocacy, uh, really promoting messages of healing, uh, denouncing stuff that shouldn't be there. But the same token, you have to say, okay, who's their funding source and what else are you supporting? Uh, the way I reconcile those sorts of challenges is to really sort of on my own, put it on a scale. And I then shift to the language of investment. As far as I'm concerned, racism and social inequities have been here for a while, they're gonna be here. so is my investment now and promoting it using this tool worth an investment uh, payoff down the road 
at some point. Uh, so is there a strategy behind my use currently for a hopeful uh, outcome later on down the line? And that's just a suggested way of reconciling it. But if you put pressure on yourself, I have to do one or the other, that's where it comes in and you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. But I think it does require ongoing self-reflection because I can guarantee if you're stuck on the Facebook, you're also going to be stuck on many other tools and it really collectively is an invitation for you to go inside to where do i really stand really and is there another way i can get a message out where i don't feel that i have to sell my soul and compromise a degree that feels uncomfortable thanks um again the chat line is open and here's another question that's coming up um the question is to be successful it is, is it imperative for people to believe that they can achieve anything, but they are constantly told that the world is unfair to women and minorities? How can we get young people to think positively and encourage that they can be successful? Part of that, I think you have to be of, of a certain mindset yourself. If you really believe and focus on the obstacles, um, which I think is something that you should think about and consider, but not focus on. I'm always promoting the idea of having a North Star vision. I, I borrow that analogy, looking at the GPS in your car. If I were to ask any of you right now in the audience, I want you to go to Podunk, Arkansas. You know, you might say, where the heck is that? But as soon as, you type in your destination coordinates, which are really the zip code, address and zip code, and your car GPS knows exactly where you are right now, the exact zip code and area. You then get three bits of information instantly. One is you get a visual picture drawn a line from point A to point B, where you're at now and where you hope to go. Secondly, you get some narrative text turn right, turn left, whatever. The third is you get an approximate amount of time it's going to take you to get there. So let's say you're locked and loaded with that information and you start your distance. Let's say it takes three days. A day into your journey, on the road you're supposed to be on, all of a sudden you discover it's impassable. There's no way to continue your journey on this road. As soon as you let your GPS know that, that little voice comes on the, um, the machine and says, recalculating route. And it does so instantly. And why? Because at that moment, it knows exactly where you are and more importantly, exactly where you were going. So knowing where you were going is critical. And obstacles become more illuminated, more obvious more of an impediment when you take your eyes off the prize. I was taught something, I'll make a personal disclosure, when I was, I don't know, 10 or 11, in the context of learning about race. One of my elders said, you know, if somebody ever calls you the N-word, it's going to hurt. It's going to sting. You're going to feel angry, ashamed, like you want to fight confused because what did you do to get that sort of acknowledgement but my elder said something that really got me scratching my head at the time because i don't know what that he was talking about he says but what you have at that moment when somebody calls you that name is is the gift of crystal clarity and i looked puzzled and i said gift what are you talking about there's nothing good about this he acknowledged that, yeah, it hurts. But as long as you know where you're going, you have the gift of crystal clarity that comes with four ingredients. You can go around to the right or to the left, over or under that particular impediment. impediment because you know exactly where he or she is coming from. There is no guesswork there. So acknowledge the sting, but don't get stuck in it. And why do you get stuck in it? Because you don't know where the heck you're going. So set a goal, dream big, be curious, 
as was mentioned by uh, Dean Smith, one of the things I do is work a lot in the area of sports. One of my all-time favorite heroes is Hall of Famer Bill Russell, 11-time NBA champ. In a book that he authored, co-wrote, um, called Russell's Rules. Early on, he makes a statement that really caught my attention back when I read it. Speaking of ball players, he said, it's important for all hoopers to have skill, to have talent, to understand the game, to have experience. But he goes on to say, curiosity is the oxygen of all success and accomplishments. So you acknowledge having a talent and ability, but it's curious, mm, how can I do that better? Wow, how did that guy do that? Mm. Here's the challenge. Okay, what can I do to solve this puzzle? 11 championships later, in the era of segregation and racism, in a place of Boston, which was historically racist, he succeeded with 11 championship rings. Mind you, in those early days, he and others, African men, couldn't stay in the same hotels as his white teammates. And I won't go into that long history. Where I'm going with that, it's important to have a vision. Keep your eyes locked on the prize. Surround yourself with people who you trust. I often tell a lot of these uh, hoopers that I work with in the NBA, I much rather you have four quarters and 100 pennies. You see, they both add up to a buck. But a quarter is 25 times the value, but you don't need a, lot, a big entourage of people. You need four people you can trust three of whom might tell you what you want to hear, one of whom is dead against what you say, so to keep you honest. But having four quarters versus 100 pennies, having a locked on goal, allowing yourself to dream and be curious about how bad can I be? You're gonna be able to find a way to manage and go around to the right, left, over and under any obstacle that comes before you. Thanks, Bill. This next question is kind of an interesting one after hearing about Bill Russell, because as many of you might recall, uh, Bill Russell went to one of our Jesuit sister schools and played uh, basketball University in Northern California at USF. Yes. Yeah, right. this next question sort of takes that concept a little bit um, in asking how has your faith shaped your view on current events and how might you implement faith into conversations and discussions without overstepping boundaries? Thanks, Emily. Faith is, is a very critical part of my existence. In, in fact, I wrote a column and everything my elders tells me has told me comes to truth, it has come to pass. And one of the things another elder taught us, if you really want to put a smile on God's face, tell him what you have planned. And at the time, you know, you don't understand these things, but boy, this COVID and this social protest movements today remind us of that how life can change quick, fast, and in a hurry, and how little control we really do have over what happens to us. And so I remain ever mindful of that. Uh, what I do in the busyness of my schedule, I, I, I don't rarely use the word busy, I use blessed. Uh, it could be very different. In my own personal circumstances, I and my family are all healthy relative to COVID and um, seem to be still doing and trying to make a contribution. And so we really do not say that it has anything to do with us. It really has to do with the creator. He has not called us home yet and really wants us to continue to do whatever works. So for me, spirituality grounds me in everything I do. And I think it comes across in conversations and, and how I talk. And I don't know that I ever formally talk about the subject of religion or faith. Uh, but it comes across in my actions and in the dialogue and what I write. Um, and I think once you really start looking toward the person and not the persona, not the image, you begin to see that you really aren't as distant as you really might think you are in the, in the beginning. I'm a psychologist by training and teach graduate students who want to become uh, therapists or counselors. In every single Psych 101 or beginning counseling book, they are taught to the phrase of, if you want to really work with your clients, you have to build a connection with them. 
you got to make sure that that uh, connection is there. And that's always been an interesting notion to me because it assumes one, that there is no connection already. And that you have to, as a prerequisite to getting movement, build and maintain that relationship. And that makes some sense conceptually. I've long since abandoned that and invite my students to consider that is a relationship already there or do you really have to construct it? I assume that it's already there and life is about discovering what is. And the analogy I often use is that of, you know, we live in Southern California, we're blessed with good weather most of the time in terms of sun. And if all of you in the audience were to go outside right now and look up in the sky, in a sunny day, you wouldn't see one star at all. But if you stayed there with your neck uh, looking toward the sky, in addition to having a crick in it, but you stay there till midnight, you'd see a million stars. Well, the question then, does the stars come out at night? Or does the darkness illuminate the stars that are already there? And of course, the answer is the latter. So that which appears, it was already there. Sometimes you need dark circumstances to bring out the genius and the light that already exists. And so better than all of you in this audience is a genius and talent that you haven't yet tapped fully. As brilliant and as successful as you are by all current markers of success. I don't know any of you on this screen, can't even see you actually, but be willing to bet my professional reputation, you have yet to tap the full genius of what you have. Thanks, but we have another question here. Um, and the, uh, the attendee asks, how do we engage in the needed conversations challenging assumption and biases without fueling the toxic, and in quotes, cancel culture in which anyone in any organization, historical figure or not, that has a perceived flaw is then deleted and shut down. Um, you don't engage in difficult conversations without stepping into toxicity. I mean, the very definition of difficult conversation, particularly around race, but then all of the uh, inequities that follow, by definition, it's festering, it's, it's toxic. Uh, even when you put on a hazmat suit emotionally, guarded with information, knowledge, self-esteem, and all that. Uh, that doesn't prevent you from going into toxic waste. And, and so I think you have to be willing to put on that hazmat suit and surround yourself with people who are going to buoy you, strengthen you, give you some perspective, somebody's on the shoulder you can cry on every now and then, but to really keep up the good fight, but also approach it in multiple ways. Certainly doing guest presentations, uh, writing and authorship, um, uh, doing uh, audio things like we're doing here, webinars. Uh, there's lots of ways to communicate a consistent message of civility, one, but responsible ethical behavior, two. Uh, but how can I, in fact, move forward in light of what is really going on? And again, there's no way to get around toxicity because you got to understand America is rooted in its original sin of white superiority, black inferiority, and everybody else is not white and male, 40 years of age and older, or less than. And you think of athletes, why do women have Title IX? Well, why do you even need Title IX? If it wasn't for Title IX, we wouldn't see half of the distinguished athletes, female athletes that we see today. It just wouldn't exist. Why do you need voting rights? Everybody is a citizen or should be in the vote. Why do you see voter suppression? Well, understand this, that America has not succeeded, uh, has not failed at racism, getting rid of it, they've succeeded at maintaining it. And all of this tension, all of this fight, all of this movement to try to dismantle the system is long overdue, is much needed, and it's triggering a counterforce to hold on to the very thing that they have held on to for 400 years. 
So if you've been holding on to something for that long, and by some objective markers, it seems to have paid off, who in their right mind would want to give that up easily? It's not going to happen. So you have to be aware that while your uh, quest to dismantle racism and, and really advocate for very visibly and audibly in terms of social justice and social equity, at the same time, there's going to be a counterforce coming at you. And that's where it's going to be important to educate younger generation, the students who come up bef uh, behind you, parents who are teaching their kids, because that's where uh, the movement is really going to have sustainability. Not in us folk now trying to eradicate it, because if that were the sole weapon, we're all going to sort of age out at some point. You don't have a, a stream behind you, a succession plan, if you will, in business terms. So it is important to have an emotional succession plan, but an actual succession plan for social justice. And that comes in mentoring and uh, paying uh, attention to the youth. Thanks, Bill. I think we have time for one last question. And um, this will be a, a, a wonderful question to end on. Um, Larry Calvers, your colleague and friend, oh, yeah. asks, uh, asks, first of all, thanks you for sharing. It says, many businesses, large and small, have made positive statements about Black Lives Matter and systematic racism. A few have made commitments to provide funds to Black organizations or loans to Black businesses and made other rather vague commitments for their organizations. These financial commitments, while sometimes large in absolute terms, seem very small compared to the size of the companies. Are there any businesses that have impressed you or resonated with you that you think are really about substantive action or plans? My fear is that some companies that want, that for, that for some companies, this is part of a news cycle and doesn't result in substantive and consequential long-term plans. What are the companies that are really yeah. making an impact doing? Well, I, that, that's a great question. And, and uh, let me answer it in this way in the interest of time. One of the things I think is important to do is not only give, put, put your money where your mouth is, so to speak, where you actually donate money. And I don't know that, I think the jury is still out. I think there are a number of companies who have done, uh, who've given substantively and, and, and very hefty sums I think it's too early to say whether that's a knee-jerk reaction to the immediacy of the of the situation. Uh, so I'm my verdict is out on how long that's going to be sustained. So I want to acknowledge that that's important and it's visible. But the other thing, other than giving money, what impresses me is taking the money away. I'm now invoking the situation with the changing of the mascot with the Washington Redskins. For a whole lot of reasons that I won't go into, and many of you probably are aware of that, is the epitome of racism against our Native brothers and sisters. If you really understand what scalping means and what redskin really means, and the bounties that were given, and if you read the history of California, uh, this is really what gets my ire here. It's, it happens here in California, but that aside, it's my understanding now that FedEx, Coca-Cola, and one other major sponsor has withdrawn their financial supporters considering from the Washington Redskins. See, so when you start getting at somebody's pocketbook, that's gonna make a difference. So giving, but also taking and deciding to redistribute that wealth in areas that are going to, that are more consistent with your value system is something that I would say is uh, something to keep our eye on. So with that, that's all I'll say now without getting into a long political discussion. Thanks so much, Bill, for joining us today, for uh, really making impactful insights, uh, giving us things to reflect on. And to the audience, thank you all so much for joining us today. As mentioned, this is recorded, so you can refer back to it. We'll get that information out to you. And please join us for our webinar this Thursday as we continue our conversation on business, the changing business landscape, and the social movement taking place with Black Lives Matter, when two of our most popular professors and experts in brand marketing, activation strategy, and consumer behavior um, speak about inauthentic brand activism with Professors Mitch Hamilton, Julian Singh, and 
Professor Julian St. Clair. They are inviting three uh, business leaders to join them on that panel and we'll continue the conversation. Bill, again, thanks to all of you, to you and all of your colleagues in the School of Ed for helping educate the next generation of leaders too. And we look forward to seeing you all on Thursday. Take Thank care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.